All right, well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fernando Kim, for the invitation. Thank you, Beth, for the amazing organization. Uh, really a pleasure to be here again. Uh, I'm going to talk about changing paradigms in the diagnosis and management of ED. Uh, these are my disclosures, and I do consult for companies that make testosterone products and ED products, and I was on the AUA ED guidelines panel. So I thought what I would do is divide this talk into two parts. There's going to be a section on talking about the AUA ED guidelines that came out in 2018, and what are the key changing paradigms that we should know about. And the second part is really about the new way we're looking at treating ED more with regenerative therapies. So let's get started. So uh, we, when we made the guidelines in 2018, we talked about the shared decision-making model. This is not new. We copied this from the PSA, shared decision-making, and the concept is very similar. If you look at the old paradigm, patient walks in with ED, you give him a Viagra, give him a Cialis, it doesn't work, then you move on to suppositories or injectables, that doesn't work, you go into an implant. And we used to call this first-line therapy, second-line therapy, and third-line therapy. And the paradigm now has changed. So if a patient walks in uh, with ED, you're supposed to counsel him on all the appropriate therapies, whether it be Viagra, vacuum, injection, uh, penile prosthesis. And as long as that patient understands the risks and benefits of each one of these, it's okay to skip the Viagra and move on. Now, there was a lot of discussion. We had this in the room. I mean, I would personally feel very uncomfortable if a patient has never tried anything and chooses penile prosthesis without trying a Viag or something else, but that is in the, uh, the uh, guidelines. The other thing I want to stress is this two important parts. One is lifestyle modification, and I can't stress to you how important diet, exercise, sleep, and stress, stress reduction are in overall improving erectile function. You know, most patients want to come in and get that pill, but if you can help them lose the weight, reduce the stress, improve the sleep, um, it makes a huge difference on overall erectile function. And the second point is mental health uh, uh, referrals and sex therapists. We don't use them enough, uh, but they really are extremely valuable, particularly for younger patients with psychogenic EG, but also patients with organic ED, it's really valuable. Now I want to stress nowhere on this graph do I see the word testosterone. Testosterone is not indicated as a treatment option, it's Viagra and injections, but nowhere do we see the word testosterone. But if you look carefully at the guidelines, we put testosterone as one of the three tests you're supposed to get. You're supposed to get a hemoglobin A1C, a testosterone, and a lipid. So why are we checking a testosterone when it's not even listed as a treatment option in the guidelines? And there's a reason for that. The reason is, is because if you look at the literature, we know that testosterone actually improves the e efficacy of the PD-5 inhibitors. So combination therapy tends to be much more effective than monotherapy uh, in a hypogonadal man. In other words, if you have a man who's hypogonadal, not responding to Viagra, you put him on testosterone therapy, anywhere from 30 to 50% of those men may start responding to Viagra once again. So that's the main reason why we put it in the guidelines. Combination therapy is very effective. Now there's one exception to this, uh, and it's my personal bias, is patients following radical prostatectomy. So I personally believe that men who are hypogonadal after a radical prostatectomy are at a significant disadvantage in recovering their erectile function compared to eugonadal men. And so we started uh, the first FDA randomized placebo-controlled trial giving men testosterone after radical prostatectomy. We worked uh, hard with the FDA because they wanted us to wait a year. We were able to convince them to let us start at three months as long as they had two undetectable PSAs and there wasn't a Gleason 3 plus 4 or higher. So that's what we do. So uh, we, we really try to get this on early, at least on before the first six months, uh, first six months after surgery. Um, so if you look at all the areas that we focused on, on testosterone, uh, I mean, in terms of penile rehab, the three biggest areas of penile rehab in the literature are how do we improve the calvinosal nerves, uh, trabecular smooth muscle, and the endothelium. And if you look carefully at the literature, I cannot find a, a better medication that actually addresses all three, which is nerves, trabecular smooth muscle, and endothelium. So again, we try to get this medication on early. The next paradigm shift is this concept of uh, the couple's disease. Remember, what is the purpose of giving this man this great erection, this great libido, and they have no one to have sex with, right? It's, it doesn't make any sense. And what you do, we find, is that you create a lot of discrepancy in the home. Now he has a very high libido, her libido is low, and there's issues in the house. So we treat all these women uh, with, for female sexual dysfunction. And the point is the following. If you treat 
a woman and significantly improve her libido, you actually will see significant improvements in men in their erectile function and their libido. And it works vice versa. If you significantly improve erectile function in men, you can actually significantly improve female sexual dysfunction. My favorite study was Dr. Goldstein's, it's an older study, where he took Levitra, it was a randomized, double-binded, placebo-controlled trial. He gave 229 men either Levitra or he gave them placebo. He said, by the way, I'm going to give your wife or your partner the FSFI, which is just like the IIEF in men, the Female Sexual Function Index Questionnaire, to learn about her sexual function. And what he found was that in those men who took uh, Levitra had a significant improvement in their erectile function, the partners at home had significant improvements in their sexual function. Those men that got placebo uh, did that not have a significant improvement in their erectile function. Those partners at home had no improvement in their sexual function. So remember, they're linked. If you improve the sexual function in one partner, you can significantly improve the sexual function in others. So why is that also important? It's very important when it comes to the post-prostatectomy patients. So we published this early in 2010, where we showed that those men after radical prostatectomy, if they have a partner at home that's more willing to engage in sexual activity, guess what? They're more likely to have significant recovery of their erectile function. If they were widowed, if they had no one at home that wanted to have sex with them, they're less likely to cover, recover the erectile function. So it is a huge advantage if you're operating on men who have partners that want to have sex all the time, as opposed to partner, men who do not have partners uh, and don't care about their sexual function, because that goes into your recovery of erectile function. So again, taking into account the female sexual function is extremely important when you're treating these men. So let's talk about the future. I think this just went out. Can you hear me? Yeah, I think it just went out. I'm going to talk a little bit. It's, it's now green again. Thank you. So let's talk about the future and what's happening here. There's this huge movement in the U.S. now on regenerative therapies, and you have seen them. I know you've seen them in the corners where it's shockwave therapy and PRP, which is called the P-shot or the Pripa shot or stem cell therapy, all for cash, and how they are improving erectile function. So I really need you to understand what's going on here and the lay of the land. And this really stems from the problem we have with our current treatment options. So you've asked patients, what's the most important consideration when starting an ED medication? The answer is, there's no cure. And if you say, what's the most important reason for discontinuing the ED medication? Because it's no longer effective. So if you remember from the Massachusetts Male Aging Study, and you look at the statistics, 40% of men had ED at 40. It's a lot. 50% had ED at 50, 60 at 60, 70 at 70, 80 at 80, right? So it goes up, it's progressive. And when you give that man Viagra for his ED, you're not, you're not curing him. You're just covering the problem that night while it gets worse every year until the Viagra stops working, right? So Viagra is not a cure for ED, right? But there is a quest over the past 10 years to look for a cure for ED. And so it really started with Vardy. So Vardy in 2010 published this very small study. And what he did was he took 20 patients who were no longer responding to Viagra. They had significant ED, and he gave them 2,500 shocks twice a week for three weeks. Then he gave them a three-week break, and then he did it again. And when, I'll be honest with you, when I first saw this study, I thought it was ridiculous. I said, shocking the penis, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. But it's actually brilliant, and I'll tell you why. If you look at the mechanism, it actually has a lot of, uh, it makes a lot of sense. But what he found was that in 10 of these 20 patients, he was able to salvage these PD-5 failures. So 10 patients who were no longer responding to PD-5 inhibitors were responding to PD-5 inhibitors. Now the problem with this very small 20 patient VARD study was that he created an explosion. So if you look and just Google, this was last month, on how the shockwave and erectile dysfunction, over 1,330,000 hits on how great shockwave is and how it can improve overall erectile function. In fact, there are multiple clinics uh, throughout the country on the corner charging anywhere from $500 to $1,000 a treatment. Typically, it's six treatments to help reverse erectile dysfunction. And if you buy a class one machine, I'll get into this a little bit later, but a class one machine does not require any FDA regulation. You don't have to have a license. You can be a hairdresser, chiropractor, anybody can buy it, and they can charge $500 to $1,000 of treatment for six treatments. And these patients uh, are going in, in, in waves. 
So what are some of the claims? I thought it was very interesting. So one claim I got off the internet was 93% success rate in erectile dysfunction and Peyronie's disease. It's not really been studied extensively in Peyronie's disease. The best one is this. In most cases, patients have achieved a satisfactory erection on the same day as the shockwave therapy. So again, patients get very excited uh, when they see these kinds of claims. In fact, now they have home shockwave devices. This is called the Phoenix, and you can buy the Phoenix for $750. It's very, patients come in and say, they, when they already come to see me, say, I've already bought the Phoenix, it didn't work, what else can you offer me? But it's quite expensive, $750, and the claims are very interesting. It's, you know, they say you don't have to, large costs, no injections, no surgery. You can do this in the privacy of your own home, and this will reverse and cure your ED. And those are the claims that are being made. Now, there are many types of machines that you can buy out there, and the two most common types of machines are the electrohydraulic and the electromagnetic. And I can't make any statements on which one's better or worse. Both are very good. What you don't want to get is something called a pneumatic machine. These are called radial machines, which are not, very, not effective at all, and they're clear, considered class one machines. Class three machines are regulated by the FDA, and you have to have a license to buy a class three machine, but those class three machines are expensive. They can be about $80,000. Class one machines, which are pneumatic, are about $20,000. And so um, most, pay, most people buy the class one because unfortunately, patients don't know the difference between a click with a class one and a click and a class three, and that's the most common machine that's being sold. Now, I'm a little biased because I do like the electrohydraulic better, but there's no head-to-head -head on electrohydraulic, electromagnetic. Uh, the only one that I would tell you that uh, you would want to be careful of is the radial. The electrohydraulic is a little bit noisier. It's what we use for the lithotripsy. This is, that's high intensity. This is low intensity. And it's a little bit noisier, and it's a little bit more expensive because you have to keep changing the probes uh, when they get, so you have to send them in and get new probes, but that's mainly the main difference. This is the one we use, it's electrohydraulic, it's MTS, um, and essentially the patient will come into the office and we give, uh, it's six zones or 3,000 shocks, and typically we'll divide them into the right and left hilum, then we'll divide it into the right and left sh uh, shaft, and then we'll divide it into the right and left crura. The only thing I would tell you is that, and I'm not basing this on any um, science or literature, but the only thing is I don't deliver the shocks in the perineum if they've had a history of prostate cancer or radiation just because of some oncological concerns. But again, if they have no history of prostate cancer or no uh, radiation, we will uh, de deliver 1,000 shocks to the crura. So the mechanism I told you was actually quite interesting. If you look, there's four main mechanisms that are thought to improve erectile function. Neoangiogenesis, and this is important. We are not the first to use shockwave for our profession. The cardiologists have been using it for years well before us, shocking the heart and getting new perfusion in neoangiogenesis. The uh, orthopedics have been using it well before us, using it for many things like plantar fasciitis. They're using it for uh, tennis elbow. So we are not the first, but it does improve blood flow into the organ. Uh, and also, the key is also stem cell activation and recruitment to this area that's damaged. So if you're in the business of taking stem cells and injecting them somewhere, you'll see in, in a moment that it's actually, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time. But if you're shocking an area that recruits the stem cells there for you, that may be more efficient than try to get the stem cells out and put them into that location. So I'm, I don't have the time to go through all the studies, but I'm gonna go through one of the more recent ones. Uh, this was came out of Europe, uh, looking at all the randomized placebo-controlled trials with shockwave to treat ED. And what you see in the risk of bias is that many of them do have high bias or unknown bias, but if you parcel out the ones with low bias, it is true that you can see a significant improvement in erectile function scores. You can see in some studies improvement in erectile hardness scores, and there has been improvement in um, uh, peak systolic velocity or penile duplex. The problem is, is that we look at something called the minimal clinical uh, uh, difference. And what you want to see is you want to see for moderate ED about a five point increase in IIEF. Um, and a lot of these may be statistically significant, but they're not clin clinically significant. So the conclusion here with this study also was that we still are not ready to say that this should be used in common practice. In fact, if you look at the AUA guidelines, uh, the guidelines state that this should still be considered investigational. There are some studies looking at combination therapy. There may be benefit in using shockwave therapy with also with uh, stem cells. So there is literature looking at that as well. 
Um, there is a study, an FDA approved study uh, at the University of Miami looking at uh, uh, PRP and shockwave. Uh, they had an R01 grant for that as well, so combination therapy may be effective. So what about stem cells? There is data to suggest that stem cells can improve cavernosal smooth muscle, decrease corporal fibrosis, improve cavernosal smooth uh, nerve function as well. This is an animal model. The issue is, very, the problem is that we don't have a single, not one, randomized placebo-controlled trial. And if you look at the numbers, they're very small. 21 patients, eight patients, 10 patients. In fact, several years ago, Dr. Mulhall and myself, we published a paper just talking about the fact that you have to be careful. Some of these clinics are charging $15,000 for an injection of stem cells based on no randomized placebo-controlled trials. Um, and the FDA has now said that you cannot give stem cells legally in the U.S., um, particularly if they're manipulated, and most of these centers have moved outside the U.S., particularly to Panama, uh, to Costa Rica, and Cancun are the three most common areas. So the AUA, again, also considers this investigational. We did publish a study. Uh, we did a study at Baylor looking at men who were, it wasn't placebo-controlled, um, but it was an FDA-approved study uh, taking stem cells in 30 patients who had ED. Um, and we, uh, this, the issue with it was it was labor-intensive. So I had to put the patients to sleep. I had to uh, get a plastic surgeon to do the lipo. We would put them in this machine called the accelerator. It would give us anywhere from 37 to 50 million stem cells. It took a lot of time, a lot of money, and, the, and I would say that the benefits were marginal. We had um, no major adverse events, maybe some hematoma, some, some bleeding, but at the end of the day, the IAF scores went up by about two, and by 12 months, it wasn't sustainable. So I can't imagine doing this every six to 12 months uh, just to help get an IAF score of two uh, improvement. And the last one is PRP, and it's actually quite easy to make. You basically just centrifuge, you add some calcium chloride, and it, if, honestly, it costs about $50 to make. Uh, the reality is, is that pa patients are being charged anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000 an injection. And if you look at a Google search as of last month, over 1,220,000 searches demonstrating how great PRP is to improve uh, overall erectile function. Up to 2021, there were only three animal studies and one human study. That's it. And that human study was based on five case reports. That's all we had until 2021, but this was a very hot commodity in many of the clinics. In 2021, there were two studies that came out, and I'm just going to show you one. It was the ran only randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial where they gave PRP twice, uh, split it by a month, and they evaluated these patients after one, three, and six months. And what did they find? If you got the PRP, there was a 69% of those patients did see a significant improvement in IIF scores compared to 27 in placebo. That change in IIEF was about four, so it's a little bit better than what we saw in stem cells. Um, no adverse events. So again, one, only one randomized placebo-controlled trial. So again, the uh, AUA guidelines uh, not only do not consider this investigational, we, had a, we put this even a little bit lower, we consider this experimental. So in conclusion, clinicians should use a shared decision-making model when treating men with ED. There should be a greater emphasis on sex therapists and lifestyle modification in men presenting with ED. And the use of stem cells, PRP, and shockwave therapy, or a combination of these, appear to be very promising to treat ED, but currently are still considered investigational. Thank you for your attention.